turn people off. We can debate and we can beat them. We've been doing it, haven't we? How many times have I gone to meetings and they, somebody comes up to me and, Ed, give them hell tonight? Sure you like to hear that. How many new members does it get you? Do you like to be told you're wrong? How do you know, let me ask you a question. How do you know what the farmers need? I am using that question because I got caught in it and proved a point to me. A person that studied people all his life said, how do you know what the farmers need? And I was the first gullible one that got up and I said, they need more money. He said, how do you know? I said, well, my gosh, man, look at the debt they're going in deeper and deeper every year. He said, how do you know? I began to think he's stupid, not me, it couldn't be me. He said, how do you know? And finally, I recognized what he was saying. He said, did you ever ask them? How many of you have asked them? And how many of you have told them? Let me give you an example. If I came to your farm and I had a better corn crop than you did and I said to you, look stupid, plant my corn, would you like that? Would you like it? If I drove a Ford and you drove a Chevy and I said, look stupid, why don't you buy a Chevy or a Ford or whatever I had? <laughs> do you think he'd do it? He'd find a dozen reasons why not to do it. And he'd be justified in doing it because we're the stupid ones, not him. We haven't recognized what we've been doing. I'll prove it to you. If I didn't feel that confident, I wouldn't be at this at ease up here today. We've been arguing, we've been debating, we win our debates. And then Ted Strait has been saying and getting across to us, when that man objects or when he asks a question that puts you on a spot, you're halfway home with him, really. It's the one who stands there and doesn't say anything or maybe agrees with you is the guy you're going to have the problem with. The guy that says your hauling in milk is too high, your checkoff is too high and all this, he's really interested. But we didn't recognize it before and we didn't know how to handle it. I got the answer to that too. Example after example you could use with uh, automobiles, corn, stoves, furniture. If you went into a salesman in a store, you ladies, and the salesman said, why well, you knucklehead, this is the only one you ought to ever buy. Do you think you'd buy it? You'd go right to his competitor and buy. You want to know a perfect example of what happened? Do you know what Henry Ford said one time? The people want to drive Fords and they want black Fords. Do you know what happened to him? General Motors came in and said, we'll give you a red car, a blue car, an orange car, whatever you want. Who's number one? General Motors. They said, what do you want? You see what we have to do with farmers? We've got to change our approach and say, what do you want? About a month ago, or six, two weeks ago, no, two months ago, there was a poll 
Remember again, these polls are accurate. Don't doubt it. If you doubt it, you listen to any national election and they'll tell you who won before the people have voted. Don't they? As soon as they start voting in the East, they'll tell the people in California who won the election. They're that sure already. It's turning people off because they're so accurate. These polls that are taken are accurate too. So a very interesting poll hap took place in Iowa. I don't know who was all they were checking out, but I know they were checking out the farmer, doctors, lawyers, salespeople, merchants, to see who was the most unpopular and who was the most disliked. The most distrusted, I think, is the right word. Of the people I've named, think about it yourself. Who do you mistrust the most? Now, I know you do it. I know you do it. Because I, I do it, I chuckle about it. It's the used car salesman. He's always got you wondering. Years ago, you know, they said, they, do you think this guy maybe put sawdust in the transmission so I can't hear it? it's going to pieces? They put 40 weight oil in the car, you know, so it would hold up to drive it 10 miles to show it to you. It would still be in there. You mistrusted him. That's what the people in Iowa said. They mistrusted him. A very short time after that, there was an article on, in there about a man that I have read about. I have studied what he said and how he succeeded it, how he succeeded. And he's the top salesperson in the United States. And guess who he is? He's a used car salesman. How does he do it? He does it exactly the way you can do it. And you can have fun to do it in doing it because I'm going to give you some examples. His name is Joe Girard. For 11 years, can you imagine this? You've had to have made an appointment with that man to buy a car from him. Now, if any of you thought you could do it, you'd probably start a used car business tomorrow. If you thought that people would call you up fast enough that you'd have to make an appointment to buy what you had, you'd probably go in that business. It didn't just happen, but the potential is, you, we have the potential much better than the used car salesman because we're the only, we're the only seller. We're the only seller of collective bargaining. They can't get from anyone else what we have. You can go to many used car salesmen. But Joe Girard has a, sec a secret. And I tried to find out just about an hour ago from Ted Strait how his approach coincides with, with Joe, what Joe Girard does. Now remember, you're going to be selling NFO when you go home. You're going to sell memberships like you never dreamed of. You've got to because I like you. It tickles me to hear you laugh because I wonder next year I'm gonna, if, if I'm still around, I'm going to ask you how many of you had the guts to try it. Joe Girard's secret is saying, I like you. It is not saying, you knucklehead, why don't you plant my corn? Am I right? I'm right. Thank you for nodding your head yes, ma'am. I'm right. Fred Lucas, are you here? I'm right. When you agree to do that, and it'll take some testing, and it'll take some courage, I heard Ted Strait 
in that dairy meeting yesterday say before he could get a very successful person to close and ask that man to put his name on that membership agreement, the sweat was running down his back and off his forehead. He couldn't bring himself to do it. Now I wonder how many of you can change your attitude and talk to some farmer that you really want in the NFO and in some way relay to that man sincerely that you like him. If you can, you're going to have success that's going to be unbelievable. You won't believe what you can do. That's all that Joe Girard claims to have used for success. It's great to get together like this and give a rousing speech of the force we got to use because of the forces against us, and I understand that. And emotionally, that's great. But when I hear also from every one of you that I ask, we need more volume, we need more members, then why don't we concentrate on that one thing? One of the directors sitting over here made a statement that really impressed me. And he's right. He said the programs in the NFO are almost infallible. They cannot fail. The only place we can fail is if we do not correct some of the things we've been doing and bringing those people in with us. Effectiveness was one of the major ones, and look out for this next one. The problem we have in image, local leadership. Now, you ought to get mad at me for saying that. Let me explain before you do. Local leadership can be a staff man. Local leadership can be a county president. Local leadership can be just a member. Image. How in the world do you expect a non-member to come with you if you're a member and don't participate in the programs? That's image. It's the image that you create. I can't believe I'd be talking to anybody in this group that don't participate 100% wherever they can. I sure hope not. Where there's programs, because nobody has ever said collective bargaining would work without the production and the volume. So that's our problem, that's what we're going after. Now, we live in a different society than we did 20 years ago or 30 years ago. You're well aware of that. So I would caution you, if you're walking down the streets of New York City or New Jersey or somewhere, and for heaven's sake, don't meet somebody on the street and say, I like you, because he's going to watch you way down the street. He's going to watch you as long as he can. There are many ways of saying I like you. You don't need those words. Sincerity is number one. Bob Arndt spoke from the stage the other day, and he made two comments. Are our objectives right? Are we reasonable in what we're asking for? And if you're sincere, and getting that across to people, it works. It works so much, I've been saying recently, it almost scares me of the ability this group of people could have and what they could do. Let me give you some examples. How many of you have traveled abroad and have had to go and get a passport and a visa? How long did it take you? I claim that I have the record as an individual without having any experience or anything else because I followed Joe Girard's advice. 
And I started at a quarter of nine in the morning, and at 4.20 that afternoon, I had two passports and two visas and two medical exams, one on a man that wasn't even there. because I said I like you. Folks, it's unbelievable. Frank Kraft is the guy I had examined and he wasn't even in Chicago. By a Brazilian doctor on top of that. It works. The Brazilian embassy opened their doors twice for me after they had locked up closing hours because I said, I like you. That's right. It'll amaze you. You'll have more fun with it than anything you've ever done. You worry about getting new membership into the NFO. You can do it and have a lot of fun. The second one, time it happened, it happened not far from Corning, Iowa. It was in Creston, Iowa. I tried it on somebody in a vision center of all places. The next one was in Omaha at the Ramada Inn. Some of the people sitting at this table were there for a meeting. I got a free breakfast out of the deal by the person that I said, I like you. Now, I didn't just say, I like you in those words, but I did it to somebody to see how they'd react. It happened to be a waitress. She, <laughs> boy. <laughs> I debated whether I should say that or not. <laughs> yeah, about a 16-year-old girl who was crying because of some problems she had. And she wouldn't let me pay for my breakfast. The next one was in Boston, Massachusetts. Budget rent-a-car. I've promised, I've told Steve Pavich, who was along that day, Art Wilson, and. Al Scott, I'd show him the letter I got back. I don't know if I ever have. It's still there, though, if you want to check it. Changing the attitude of a person and getting them to want to come and help and work with you. And that's the key. Now the last one. I was in Sioux Falls two weeks ago. How many of you people were at the Sioux Falls grain meeting? Would you please stand up? Is there anybody here from Sioux Falls who was at the Sioux Falls grain meeting? Oh, I look at them. I'm proud of them. How many of you fellows are here? Four of you? They were at that meeting at four or five? The what? Oh, okay. Six. That meeting. There were 12 people in that meeting eligible to sign up in the VIP program. How many do you think signed up that day? 11 of them. And I want to apologize for the job I did of explaining it. But I also want to congratulate you because if there's anybody in this room that hasn't, that's got grain and hasn't signed up in the VIP program, you're missing a tremendous opportunity to make collective bargaining if you leave this convention without doing it. And I'll listen to the tape that day, but all I tried to do, and I tried to do it and I did it sincerely, there are a good bunch of people in South Dakota. The uh, treasurer just said, you bet. Where do you think he's from? <laughs> so are you from every state that you're from. And so are the people that are back home. They're the finest people in the world. We should be telling them that. We should not be calling them knuckleheads. We should not be saying they're stupid. We have the ability to make that person feel that we need them and want them and are interested in them. 
because we are. We're interested in them because we need them and they need us. But that communication is broken down somewhere that we haven't been able to eliminate the problem I heard in every commodity meeting. We need more volume. Now, how many of you believe, really believe now, that you could bring yourself to do that? To walk into a very progressive farmer today, knowing in your own mind that he's going to be in problems if he's not in problems today. How many of you could walk in and honestly want to help him and make that man or that woman or the two of them feel that and know that? You'll sweat before you find out, before you do it. Not all of you, but a lot of you will because you've seen Butch or somebody do this. When I point my finger and say you're stupid, those other three are pointing back at me. I'm the stupid one for not being able to do it. Think of the market we've got. Seventy percent of those people want what we have. But we are, we've told them we haven't asked them. When they didn't understand us, rather than let them blow that air out of their balloon and give them the chance, we debated them and we beat them. How many do you think you're going to get that way from now on? Not very many. The effectiveness is showing up. That one is about cured. We know that the way the producers are beginning to come with us. And now I'm going to get real personal and relate something. I don't know if the young man is here. Is Mark Haberman here? He didn't come. I want to tell you that something happened uh, the other day on a telephone call to me. It was Howard Fisher had sent a message into the home office and asking if someone would contact a young man by the name of Mark Haberman. Is that, do I have the right name on that, Howard? He said he's disappointed or he wants some answers on the butter sale. Why didn't we object to it and things like that. I did call Mark Haberman. He's a young man. I'd say 25. I may be off on that a little bit. He's farming with his father. Howard's saying I'm about right on that. That really wasn't what he wanted to talk about. He wanted to talk about the National Farmers Organization and really why, why can we promise people that this organization will not go the way many other organizations have gone. And in his own mind, he was concerned that it was going to be run by some powers. So powers in his mind perhaps was President Woodland Vice President Arndt or myself. And I said, Mark, I share your same fears. And the only way you can protect yourself from that is by coming to the convention. That, at that time, he said, I'll see you at the convention. I want to meet you. Because that's the only way you can ever lose control of this organization. But our people have to know that. Our young people have to know that. They have to know that we want them here. We have to know that we want them to get in leadership positions. We have to get them to know that we built it for them, not for us. And how do you do that? By saying you're a knucklehead? Of course not. I wish Mark Haberman were here today. Then he'd understand. Because when we had the young farmers meetings, I had about 40 in, the, in my office in Corning, Iowa. They were sitting on the floor. There weren't seats. And I said to them, this is your organization. Take it over. 
they went home bewildered. I don't know if there's anybody in this room today that I said that to, young people and young farmers meeting. You bet. That's what this organization is all about. And that's the, the market we have is unbelievable. And the ability that you and I have, nothing can stop us if we just stop to realize that other people have used it and all they say really is, I like you. Now you know why I said it when I opened this up. Well, I get a lot of kidding around the office. Every once in a while somebody comes up, I like you, Ed. <laughs> I'll continue to take that because I know it works. I know it works. And if there's a time that we have to debate, and there are times, and fight hard, and that's in, on farm bills and things like that, that's great. But the American farmer is not one that is going to tolerate you or I coming onto his farm and telling them that he must do something. He doesn't have to do that. But you have the ability of walking on his farm, and if he likes you, remember 80% of all the sales made in the nation are made because the buyer likes the person that's making the sale. I heard Lee Elliott was up here today filling in or giving a little talk on something. Do you know the second, or not the second, but one of the big complaints I hear when I'm talking to someone who is not a member of the NFO when I'm out in the country? Why don't I see the signs on your farms? You know what I'll bet? I'll bet there's some people in this audience don't have a, fa a nice farm sign up that says National Farmers Organization out at their driveway. I'll bet you there's somebody in this room. Do you want this organization to grow? Do you want it to do what it can do? Do you ever realize how little it would take to put that sign up and then maybe one for somebody else? There's so many things that we can use to help this organization along. I, and I'm using the wrong word, to help this organization. I shouldn't be saying that. It's to help you and to help me and to help everyone in rural America. That's the responsibility we have and I have just given you the answer. I challenge you to try it. Some of you are sitting there with a sober face right now. If you try it, you will be successful. And when you're successful, you will start to smile. And when you start to smile and you are successful, the NFO is going to reach its goals and gain the objectives we started out to gain. Thank you.